Yes. Hello, I'm Christina Davis, Director of the Program on U.S.-Japan Relations. And we are here today to discuss the United Nations role in the global disarmament agenda. And we're here, some of us in person and some of us joining remotely for a hybrid seminar, which is a very exciting for us here at Harvard. And it's at a time when we really do need to talk about the United Nations role in disarmament because the world faces new risks. We have everything from cybersecurity to the pandemic raising attention to biological threats, intentional and unintentional, while all of the old risks of conventional weapons from light arms to ballistic missiles and of course nuclear weapons are equally worrying. At the same time, the great powers have increasing tensions and the only hope is that we can increase confidence building measures and possibly even move forward on a new disarmament agenda that will take on these issues of great concern. And as we face this difficult time in international affairs, we're really fortunate that we have leadership at the United Nations such as Izumi Nakamitsu, who is going to help to set this agenda and bring together the world leaders so that they can come up with a new approach to international security. She is really a great leader who has spent many years at the United Nations. She is the Under Secretary General who is in charge of the Disarmament Affairs and is the Under Secretary General and High Representative for Disarmament Affairs. She started work at the United Nations in 1989 and has worked in many different capacities. She's worked with former Secretary General Kofi Annan in the UN reform. She's worked on peacekeeping affairs in many different capacities. And she's also worked in the High Commissioner of Refugees, including field operations in former Yug Yugoslavia, Turkey, and Northern Iraq all of the complex security missions of the United Nations have been part of your work as an international civil servant. And we are just so honored to have you here as our distinguished visitor for the program on U.S.-Japan relations. I would say the Distinguished Visitor Series is something where we bring a special guest once a year. And back in the year 2000, the distinguished visitor was Sadako Ogata. Mm -hmm in her last year as the Commissioner of Refugees. At that time, I was a graduate student at Harvard, and I still remember hearing her remarks in the spring of 2001, when the Taliban had just destroyed the Buddha statues oh. to the great horror of the world. And she came and said, no one had been noticing the refugees at the foot of the statues and all of the horrors of the Taliban when it was just another horrific regime. But the destruction of the Buddha statues drew the world's attention. And of course, later in 2001, 9-11 would draw the world's attention to the Taliban. And it is so um, reminiscent to think now that once again, that we're all paying attention to what does it mean that the Taliban have come back and realizing that insecurity in any part of the world can cause insecurity for the rest of the world. And so the disarmament agenda is everything from the great powers, nuclear arms control, to what do we do about the flood of weapons in Afghanistan and a return of the Taliban. And so I'm really delighted that we can um, come back to the United Nations and have you address us today. And I would like to acknowledge that the seminar is part of the special series for policy innovations and crises. It's supported by a grant from the Japan Foundation Center for Global Partnership. We're also very delighted to have co-sponsors, the International Security Program of the Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs at the Harvard Kennedy School. Now, today's format is going to be conversational. I'll start off with a few questions and then open up to everyone, and this is being recorded on the record, and so we will respect your position as a representative of the United Nations. Um, I'd like to start off, and when we think about 
the rising tensions and increase of military expenditures, all of the trends that we see from spending on guns to new artificial intelligence and cyber warfare. What are these trends going to mean for the agenda of disarmament? Thank you. First of all, before getting into that, uh, it's a real honor for me um, to be able to uh, speak today. And uh, thank you for this uh, um, Mrs. Ogata's appearance here also, um, it brings uh, a particularly a special touch for me. Um, she was one of my long-term mentors in, in the UN system, obviously. Um, and thank you also for, um, you know, talking about disarmament um, in more sort of comprehensive setting. Um, you know, our sort of automatic reflex is to, to look at nuclear weapons, etc. But indeed, uh, disarmament um, is a security instrument and, and you know, it is useful uh, in many different contexts, including in um, you know, many parts of the world where we still see conflict uh, raging. Um, small arms and light weapons are in, indeed you know, uh, fuel um, into, it's an enabler of, um, of um, uh, conflict and then through better regulation and control of, of this, we believe that uh, the conflict itself can be uh, better managed and, and brought to uh, solution, resolutions. Um, now, military spending, um, it's, um, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure many people have heard uh, recent CIPRI statistics. Um, we obviously suffer global pandemic, uh, and yet, and then the world economy uh, shrunk, it contracted, and yet the military spending actually went up by, I think, 2.6% or something. Now, very close to $2 trillion dollars definitely uh, highest uh, since the, the Cold War period. Um, and um, this is happening against the background of many countries, including this country and, and my country, Japan, um, need to actually allocate finite resources to recover, I mean, first and foremost, put COVID under control, uh, put an end to it, and also um, really think about recovery from COVID. Uh, and many other competing um, uh, priority agendas. Um, so we believe at the United Nations there will have to be a new, um, renewed interest um, on military expenditure. Um, it's interesting that at the height of a, a previous Cold War, that is the, the US-Soviet Union Cold War, uh, in 1980, uh, there was a very strong call to look at military expenditure, and there was an instrument that was created, uh, it's called um, a MILEX, a UN um, uh, instrument, where member states will come and report on their military expenditures. And at the height of it, I think it's soon after the, the, the Cold War, um, you know, countries actually, as many as close to 100 member states submitted on you know uh, uh, their reports uh, on their military expenditures that the objective of this minex instrument is to create better transparency uh, and that transparency hopefully would lead to confidence building uh, and therefore uh, the, the upward trend of um, uh, military spending will gradually come down now it is a charter vision as well um, the un charter article 26 actually has a, a reference to um, military spending. Um, it's calling uh, you know, all member states to um, maintain um, international peace and security with least a diversion of the world's economic and human resources to armament. Um, so it's, it, uh, it's within the, if you will, DNA of the United Nations to, to make sure that uh, military spending will not um, you know, um, get into an uncontrollable um, uh, situation. I think now is the time with the COVID, etc. We need to put renewed um, um, emphasis and then make sure that this um, um, whole issue will be reactivated uh, with obviously more creative, innovative um, um, methods um, so that the upward trend of uh, um, military expenditure, which is obviously a reflection of what you have you know, laid down, which is the um, deteriorating 
international security environment. Uh, many states have real or perceived uh, threats, and that is driving them uh, to increase the defense expenditures, military expenditures. Now, in different contexts of different reasons, um, obviously in countries in conflict situations uh, have a greater reasons for increasing the, the military expenditure. Military expenditure in many of the developed countries uh, also is about economy and jobs. So it's a very complicated issue. Um, and I, I think um, this Milex needs to be looked at um, with, a, with a view to how can we update these mechanisms um, that will actually address some of those concerns in the 21st century. Um, you know, it used to be as close to 100 countries reporting. It's now between 30 and 40 countries. So there is a, a much sort of a, a decreased number of countries also uh, utilizing this uh, mechanism. Um, so we would like to uh, start looking at those instruments uh, with a renewed focus mm. on what it is that the UN's uh, role should be in in those areas. Um, so we, the, it's also looked at from uh, women, peace and security dimensions as well. Um, there's a, a very strong call from women, peace and security community um, mm. that uh, military budget uh, needs to have a renewed focus um, and reinvestment, um, I mean reallocation of resources from military expenditure to uh, social economic um, um, investments, uh, not least uh, the uh, climate change and, and the achievement of sustainable development goals. Mm. So we will be um, reactivating this, uh, uh, this area of work um, in the, the months to come. Right. And in the participants, are Japan and the United States at the forefront? <laughs> I hope so, yes, but uh, I, I would be very keen to, um, you know, have some exchanges on how, you know, the, the new uh, security paradigm dynamics, which of course in, you know, in the Far East region, um, very difficult, mm. um, how this would impact on military expenditure. Mm. Um, and within that, um, we hope uh, from the United Nations, one of the, the messages that um, we are repeating is that disarmament, arms control, mm. is not uh, some sort of a utopian ideal. Mm. Um, it, we look at those disarmament and arms control negotiations and agreements as a security instrument. Mm. Um, you know, throughout the history, uh, unlimited arms race have never actually led to a sustainable peace and security. Um, it has to be always a combination of appropriate defense capacities, but also multilateral um, um, diplomacy, mm. uh, and in particular, disarmament and arms control uh, negotiations always um, existed mm. uh, as part of a security tool. Um, it was the case during the Cold War, the previous Cold War, US-Soviet <laughs> Union Cold War, um, there was um, um, a very good piece in New York Times just on Saturday, mm. the 30th of October, um, was the um, 60th um, anniversary of um, Tso Bomba. This is the, the hydrogen H-bomb testing by the Soviet Union and how that was dealt with but by the United States, then um, President um, um, John F. Kennedy, and how he had a calculated non-response approach. Um, uh, that was really interesting to, to read. Um, another example, of course, uh, just a, a year after the Cuban Missile Crisis, um, the world was able to have partial uh, test ban treaty. So at the height of a, a really difficult security environment, hmm. disarmament negotiations actually played a positive role to de-escalate tensions. So we, we hope that um, um, there will be a renewed focus and understand a better understanding of, of those instruments as hmm. part of the security discourse. Hmm. Are you optimistic looking at the 10th review of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation <laughs> Treaty that it can be renewed with a more comprehensive agenda and what would be your goals for thinking about how to strengthen non nuclear non-proliferation? Um, I hope it will become um, 
you know, the first step towards that, um, you know, the objective um, of um, uh, controlling the um, arms race uh, dynamics and, and potentially also reversing it. Um, it is taking place in a, you know, broadly speaking, uh, not entirely positive environment where, you know, many of the disarmament and arms control um, regimes um, agreements are eroding or have disappeared. Um, and um, definitely the relations between uh, nuclear weapon states are deteriorating. Mm. Um, but there are some positives. Um, you know, the US and Russian Federation have returned to a regular strategic stability dialogues. Mm. Um, and while, you know, the, the discussions must be definitely quite difficult, they seem to be very genuinely and sincerely engaged in the very, you know, substantive discussions. That's, that's very good. Um, and um, the reconfirmation, restatement by uh, Presidents um, Biden and Putin uh, of this very famous uh, Go Reagan Gorbachev statement, mm. uh, there is no winner uh, in nuclear war, uh, therefore it should never be fought. Um, those things actually provide a better at atmosphere for MPT review conference also to, to take place uh, to produce a, a reasonably good outcome. Um, so I think there are quite a lot of uh, discussions taking place um, between and, uh, and amongst uh, states parties. Mm. Um, our hope is that there will be um, definitely reaffirmation, confirmation of this uh, non-use you know, uh, non principle of nuclear weapons um, and um, commitment, reconfirmation of commitments uh, that were made in the past, in, you know, uh, in the past under the NPT. Um, and um, I would say very urgently, um, they will have to be um, practical risk reduction measures mm -hmm. agreed upon. And I know that there are a lot of uh, good work being done, discussions being done, um, not just within the, um, the nuclear weapon states, um, but also in the broader communities. Uh, and this provides a common um, uh, ground you know, for nuclear weapon states and non-nuclear weapon states to agree that we need to have concrete measures to avoid nuclear uh, risks um, escalating without control. So there are good uh, discussions taking place. I, I hope that these will be captured as part of the, um, the outcome documents. Um, and uh, of course, um, as the UN, uh, I hope that they will be, um, you know, uh, some sort of a, a recognition that, for example, science and technology developments, you know, some of the new and emerging uh, challenges to nuclear area uh, will be also acknowledged so that states parties will be able to, you know, in perhaps not in this particular um, review conference, but in the next cycle of the review, uh, they will be able to actually look at some of those new challenges. Um, and this will be quite important to, to make sure that NPT remains relevant in the, in the 21st century. It has always been a centerpiece of um, um, international peace and security. Mm. It's, uh, and, and it will have to remain so. Um, and and uh, I, I have high hopes that uh, states parties will take the responsibility um, to make sure that this will be the case. One of the challenges is, of course, that even if the state parties all accept their obligations, there are important countries that are not members to the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And North Korea, on the path to developing a nuclear weapon, withdrew from NPT. So as we think about the North Korean crisis, which is so important to all of us following US-Japan mm -hmm. relations, is there any path forward, the dream of a nuclear-free Korean peninsula. In the pragmatic, what are good concrete steps and what is the long-term achievable goal? Yes. Um, first of all, I think the North Korea DPRK um, issue is one of the most difficult um, case of um, uh, proliferation. Um, and. Um, you know, many different attempts were made, have been made in the past. Um, and um, our position, our message from the UN is that there is no other way than uh, diplomacy and negotiations uh, to make sure that um, 
denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula uh, will be realized. Um, I know that um, the U.S. administration has done the policy review, um, and uh, I know that there are also intense uh, consultations taking place in the region. Um, one thing that, uh, that is an, uh, a priority for us at the UN is to try and make sure that the Security Council unity is maintained. Um, what um, frames our approach to, I mean, UN's approach to uh, DPRK is the series of um, Security Council resolutions. Uh, and uh, without the unity of the Council, um, from a multilateral point of view, it would be very difficult to um, you know, add contributions to the resolution of that uh, crisis. But I must say it is one of the, the most um, uh, difficult cases uh, with a new, I mean, the PRK has not um, done any nuclear uh, testing, but they ha as you know, they have been uh, testing many different delivery vehicles, uh, the missiles, etc. And, and um, it, it remains uh, one of the, the biggest concerns that we have uh, from a regional security point of view, as well as um, the global uh, non-proliferation um, point of view. Mm. And as we celebrate 30 years since both North and South Korea became members of the United Nations, we can hope that talks might receive a new initiative. We hope. Good luck. Yes. <laughs> but even if we're not just focused on nuclear weapons, but we're also thinking about the light arms, this is actually an issue that Japan has long taken an initiative on and in trying to increase the mm -hmm. registry of light arms trade and your office has pushed to try and control illicit arms trade. How will you work to limit this sale and what are the steps that can be used to monitor, to punish countries that let illegal arms trade flourish? Yes. No, thank you for that question. Um, as I said, this, become, this is one of the priorities of the Secretary General. He captured this whole area of uh, small arms and light weapons as disarmament that saves lives. Mm. Because this is you know, something that you can actually have. Even though the global sort of you know, big security context is uh, deteriorating, mm. um, at the, you know, if we can bring those norms that have been created at the global level, mm. um, if we can implement, better implement those instruments at the country level, uh, we can actually contribute to reducing, um, you know, human lives being lost. A um, couple of things. Um, we have now something called ATT, uh, Arms Trade Treaty, mm -hmm. that is a, a major uh, achievement in, 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 in our view. Um, that is basically, you know, making sure that arms transfer uh, will be regulated in accordance with the humanitarian concerns. And Japan has, um, has been very active um, in, in that uh, treaty mechanism as well. Um, in the, um, uh, we have something called uh, um, a program of action on small arms and light weapons in all its aspects. That's the, the long official name. And um, we want to um, make sure that this will also go into a next level of, um, if you will, um, better implementation. Mm -hmm. For example, through a voluntary, um, I mean, enc through encouraging voluntary um, national level uh, uh, plan um, made, it's a little bit like a SDG uh, approach. Um, if each uh, UN member states were to, to make their national strategies and national plans at their country level, we at the international community level will be able to better support their um, um, implementations. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and um, we have created, the Secretary General has created. Please <coughs> have a glass of water. Yes, thank you. Yes. <coughs> yes. Helping to trace where the light arms are going is so mm -hmm. important. And if the governments will cooperate, yes, you can create a <coughs> registry that is activated and followed by academics who study. We use in our data the arms transfers. 
Yeah, and also um, it's what is important is that um, um, the, their actions are supported at the national level, as mm. I mentioned. So the Secretary General created this new uh, funding facility mm. called Salian, Saving Lives Entity, mm. which is part of the Secretary General's Peace Building Fund. Mm. Um, the basic idea behind it, and Japan and New Zealand were um, some of the two of the, the first countries to put you know, contributions into that fund. The basic idea behind it is that we need to address those small arms issues from a much more holistic point of view. Mm. And rather than having short-term project-based quick um, impact projects, I mean, they are fine too, we need to have more programmatic interventions. Mm. Um, for example, through um, you know, making sure that countries have the right legislations um, to control and regulate flows of small arms. They need to have better you know, border control mechanisms. Mm. Um, you know, they need to have a, a security sector having actually the capacity to, mm. to you know, manage those facili weapons facilities, the, the depots, etc. And um, it has to be also integrated into um, what we call violence reduction um, type of pro programs at the community level. Mm. Um, those small uh, weapons are often the weapon of choice when it comes to um, gender-based violence. Mm. So we need to look at those is you know, weapons issues from more, more of a comprehensive point of view and that requires an integrated approach at the country level mm. um, so that we will be able to tackle those issues with a medium to longer, longer term um, uh, commitment. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of um, uh, new approaches that we're trying to bring to this uh, small arms and light weapons area. Mm. Um, and again, uh, this is um, you know, something that uh, the Secretary General actually takes a, a great interest in mm. um, and hopefully uh, will also become one of the contributions to um, sustaining peace efforts mm. uh, at um, many different parts of the world. Will Afghanistan be one of the parts of the world where collecting weapons is possible? Well, one of the things that is uh, always critical for the UN approach is that the government takes the ownership and the leadership. So if um, the, the new Afghan government uh, is keen to tackle those issues and if they take a responsibility and ownership, um, then we would be uh, potentially able to work um, uh, with them. But the starting point is that uh, the government actually takes the, the ownership and the leadership. Uh, some of the, the early um, country cases where we are tackling this uh, for through the salient uh, funding facility in uh, Jamaica. Um, it's a, not a conflict um, context, but it is, um, you know, small arms is a, a main driver of violence, mm. violent crimes that is taking place in Jamaica. Um, we are also um, starting our work in Cameroon mm. uh, and South Sudan. So these are some of the, you know, you can see there are different contexts uh, where the, the guns, the small arms actually mm -hmm. play uh, fuel uh, violence. Uh, and we hope to be able to achieve some um, results mm. um, so that we will be able to gradually expand um, uh, our activities. Beyond. By the way, we're not, um, UNODA is not an operational entity. Mm. Um, so the entities within the UN that are uh, helping the governments, those three governments to implement is UNDP, mm. uh, UN Development Program, mm. um, you know, and then we actually provide expertise and, and, um, um, and some of the technical capacities uh, so that uh, the, the, the right program formulation can take place. We're laying out a very ambitious agenda to control military expenditures, revise the Treaty on Non-Proliferation, push the Korean parties to negotiate and deal with small conflict in light arms, all at a time when the United Nations faces backlash against multilateralism here in the United States and many other countries have also started to question multilateralism in general and 
the United Nations may struggle to establish itself as a legitimate focal point for these negotiations as rising nationalism is increasingly gaining traction. So how do you counter narratives of nationalism and complete our nation first sovereignty protection with the need for greater cooperation for security? I think it's one of the, the key uh, issues. Um, if we were to, to succeed collectively, not just on arms control, international security, but many other things, uh, climate change, you know, the Glasgow COP26 mm -hmm. opened. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think we need to really um, accurately understand where the source of this unilateralism, um, you know, mistrust for multilateral corporations came from. Mm -hmm. um, and I remember 2015, you know, that was a, a year of big success, of course, the, the 2030 Agenda and SDGs adopted. And in December, there was Paris uh, Climate uh, Agreement. And then next year, 2016, um, you know, there was a big uh, um, sort of a, a unilateralism um, 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 popping up in, in many countries, including in, in this country. Um, where did it come from? I mean, definitely one of the trigger, uh, I, I remember I was at the time in, in UNDP uh, dealing with crisis response through development cooperation. Mm. One of the trigger was, of course, the Syrian refugee crisis. Mm. Um, you know, many European countries fear that, you know, thousands of, of uh, refugees will, will arrive um, and, and that created a, a fear. But I think fundamentally, um, it is um, the fact that many people in different parts of the world, including in this country, felt that they were left behind and they did not benefit from globalism um, they did not, you know, they, they, they were left behind by many of those positive aspects of uh, global cooperation, multilateralism. And that uh, fundamental sort of anger and frustration led to um, unilateralism in this country, America first, um, and, and many other countries um, across the globe uh, expressing a lot of um, skepticism um, against global cooperation. But the fact of the matter is many of, or I would say most of those global challenges, you cannot, we cannot resolve by one country alone um, because the nature of the crisis are all global. We require global cooperation. Um, so how to, um, you know, re sort of construct the spirit of global cooperation. Uh, I think is definitely um, in each uh, country, and I would even go as far as each society also rethinking uh, a social contract mm. um, and then making sure that in every corner of the globe, um, no people are left behind. Uh, and we need to reconstruct trust between institutions and the people. Institutions includes government, um, in their national boundaries, but also institution includes the United Nations. Mm -hmm. We need to make sure that global cooperation and what the UN um, can do will also bring benefits to those people who, who feel that they, they were uh, left behind. Um, and, and many of those thinkings actually were, uh, you know, gathered together in the, the recent report which the Secretary General uh, published on the 10th of September this year. Um, it's uh, the, the title of the report is Our um, Common Agenda. And this was put together at the request of last year's General Assembly, which was of course the 75th anniversary of the, the founding of the United Nations. Mm -hmm. And in that report, the Secretary General really talks about how important it is to reconstruct um, trust and one of the, the important um, first step is to review and, and reconfigure, if you will, a social contract between people and various institutions. So sorry, it's a long uh, um, response, but I think we, we need to, um, to look at the fundamental root causes of why um, the multinational cooperation 
um, uh, is suffering. And, and I think it goes down all the way to individual people not trusting um, the processes and institutions. Right. And so the increase of transparency of negotiations as well as better understanding, as you say, that disarmament is also about security and allowing a freeing of resources to spend on those people's needs. Yep. So I think connecting all of these threads will be part of the task ahead to build confidence. But we also need students to be engaged. I'm so happy we can be here. I wish we could have invited more students. But we do want to think of, as a university, as a community, how can we get students more engaged in international peace. We are long past the days of the 70s. Yes. What are the types of outreach activities you take or would recommend to us as teachers and researchers? Yes, um, youth participation um, is a really important part of this Sector General's report on our common agenda. Um, it, is, it has become a huge you know, hugely important part of our priority in disarmament as well. Mm. We have launched um, uh, several um, initiatives targeting uh, youth population. Uh, hashtag Youth for Disarmament uh, is an initiative, you know, to connect people, empower people, educate younger people, mm. provide them with a, a platform for them to learn from each other and, and connect and, and voice their concerns, etc. And we've been running a lot of um, um, activities um, with uh, the, the youth uh, around the world. Uh, we've created something called a, um, a youth fellowship program, um, which is a special training, I mean, modeling on this very popular uh, fellowship program. You know, we've been for the past 40 years or so, the UN um, has been running a fellowship program for young diplomats. Um, you know, we teach uh, everything about disarmament through, uh, you know, I think it's six or eight weeks long uh, program. Um, modeling on that, we have created something for students. Um, and, um, and so these kinds of uh, education and empower, very importantly, empowering opportunities and for them to connect with each other uh, is a, a very important part of engaging with younger people. Mm. We want to obviously, you know, see something similar to the climate uh, movements, um, you know, largely led by younger people. Um, I think it would be quite important for younger people to, to think about what security means for them. Um, I think one of the, the lessons that, um, I mean, COVID had many different lessons, but one of the lessons that we, we are learning in the security community is that the, the concept of security itself uh, has to be really uh, thought through. Mm. Um, is it, you know, hardcore military security, national security? Mm. We would like to see um, humans brought much more at the center of security uh, considerations. Um, and I, I think the younger people uh, have a special uh, a role to play in that kind of discussions. And so we are very much engaged with the youth. And we have also um, a mandate uh, from the, the General Assembly. Um, there was um, um, a new, in 2019, there is a new resolution on youth um, and disarmament adopted uh, by the General Assembly First Committee. So. So it has been recognized as a priority uh, issue in the disarmament community as well. Excellent. Well, many of the topics we've discussed will help make our lectures and seminars more interesting to come. I'd like to now open it up to questions. And I think we've touched on many of the upper level in issues that are ahead, but there are so many. And I welcome input first, our associate with the program on US-Japan relations, Shuhei Kurizaki, who is a professor of political science and economics at Waseda University. If you can step to the microphone. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. And for sharing the ideas on the important issues on uh, disarmament and global governance with us. Um, so you touched upon many important issues, and I'm 
trying to think what would be the <laughs> good questions to, to, uh, to ask and start with. Uh, so along the way, you mentioned that the, uh, well, Christine by the, uh, uh, opened up the conversations with how the issues of uh, you know, arms control and uh, disarmament has been diversified. Right? Not only nuclear weapons or uh, light arms and so forth, so biological threats, but also recently we hear uh, through news media, uh, we hear a lot about emerging and disruptive technologies. So I also, at the, on one hand, we hear a lot about, a lot of conversations about how we should uh, come up with a new uh, defense systems and strategies. That's, uh, that's you know, going in the opposite directions of disarmament, right? So, so I guess the first question that I'd like to ask is uh, how the United Nations envisions that the, uh, right, uh, or you envision that the United, States, uh, United Nations could help sort of reconcile sort of, you know, uh, the need for humanitarian needs for disarmament as well as uh, sort of the national security concerns I think at the end of the day, uh, we have to have right, uh, sort of the, uh, uh, on the same page between two camps. I think that the, uh, back in 2017, the Treaty of nu uh, Prohibition of the Nuclear Weapons, I guess that was the sort of epitome of how difficult it is to have those uh, nuclear weapon states and umbrella states, like such, including Japan, to, uh, you know, to be on the same boat with the rest of the world uh, calling for disarmament. So I'd like to hear about you know, uh, United Nations uh, strategies to deal with uh, tensions, right? And all, uh, in light of uh, sort of new technologies and the, the movement for uh, uh, armament. Thank you. Thank you for that question. No, I should have mentioned the, the, the tech part of it um, because it is definitely, large part of uh, our work today um, and um, you know the, the science and technology uh, really rapidly progressing um, poses a very new kind of challenges um, and then you know the challenges are in different uh, dimensions I mean one that um, unlike the, the nuclear weapon technologies those technologies are all you know uh, multi-purpose or dual purpose mm. Um, and, um, and so you cannot really regulate and, and ban technology itself. Uh, it's about the application and the use of those technologies. And of course, these technologies are readily available. I mean, it's, it's being um, developed by private sector um, and, and quite easily. Um, young um, you know, students um, probably in um, you know, a kitchen table with a laptop sort of a situation. So it's, um, you know, it's bringing a very new types of um, 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 challenges. Um, they are already quite good discussions take, taking place. And I'll just give you a couple of uh, um, um, uh, examples. In the cyber uh, security field, um, you know, the UN actually has been discussing this, this issue for almost two decades. But recently, since 2018, um, there have been some uh, good progress made uh, based on the 2015 um, 11 norm, uh, voluntary norm of uh, state responsible state behavior um, through the um, um, group of governmental experts and also open-ended working group where for the first time the entire UN membership was able to you know, participate in, in these discussions. We have two consensus uh, adopted uh, reports, which actually provide quite strong um, a basis for uh, further actions. You know, the norms, you know, the do, both do's and don'ts, you know, these are the things that you should not do. These are the things that you should do, both positive and uh, negative obligations. Um, we are entering into the second phase of this um, uh, open-ended working group. The substantive discussions will start in December, so we are, um, um, you know, uh, preparing um, this uh, together with uh, the president um, of this working group, which is uh, Singapore. Um, so I think um, we are now really entering into how can we um, implement what have already been agreed. 
um, how can we make sure that some sort of a plan of action is formulated to make sure that um, governments can um, you know implement those norms mm -hmm. that's cyber um, on the AI um, laws um, lethal autonomous weapon system uh, there is also discussions taking place in Geneva in the context of uh, CCW that is convention on certain conventional weapons it's a framework agreement um, very much a humanitarian uh, driven um, um, framework ag agreement which I think is really great and I'll come to the tension dichotomy be between humanitarian and, and, and security concerns which in our view does not have to be actually dichotomy uh, but the, the law's discussions also reaching a very critical moment, also in December <laughs> this year. Um, the GG, the Group of Governmental Experts, uh, will have its final session um, in um, December. And then the review conference of the CCW also taking place a few days uh, later in December. Um, we hope that they will be a strong enough um, progress um, that can be demonstrated by participating states mm. uh, in that framework. Um, I think there are a lot of willingness now um, starting to emerge and the Secretary General himself has taken a very strong position on this, uh, advo advocating for um, ban on fully autonomous weapons, mm. uh, meaning um, the decision on whether or not to use lethal force has to remain always with human commanders. It cannot be delegated to machines because the entire uh, accountability framework under the um, international humanitarian law um, is with humans. We cannot um, hold machines accountable. Um, so uh, there is a, a momentum building up and I hope that in December uh, there will be some uh, good progress uh, that can be demonstrated. Um, so that's one. And then we will also have um, outer space discussions starting next year um, in the uh, open-ended working group format to come up with some sort of a better understanding or agreement on um, what constitutes responsible state behavior in outer space? What are irresponsible um, behavior in, in outer space? And what, what are, uh, how do you define threatening uh, um, behavior? Um, and, and so um, we are now starting to prepare <coughs> very concretely on this uh, working group. So what I wanted to say is that in individual thematic areas, there are already quite good multilateral discussions taking place. To go to the next level, I think we need to make sure that there will be an overall sort of understanding of how these different issues actually are linked. Or we need to make sure that uh, the 21st century arms control and disarmament discussions uh, will be always informed by those uh, technological developments. How would that impact nuclear weapons field, for example? Um, so I think uh, this is a, a key, absolutely a key uh, uh, area. One area that is um, that has always been, um, um, in my view, a bit of a black hole. I mean, that has not been sufficiently addressed. Is the missiles mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, we all see the news of hypersonic weapon, hypersonic missiles being tested in different parts of the world. Um, that's also a new uh, technological development in the whole area of missiles. We don't have a global norm. Uh, we don't, at the moment, we do not have multilateral discussions taking place. And then I think this is an area where we need to uh, start um, uh, having some serious uh, reflections on. Um, humanitarian versus security. Um, to me, these two does not have to be, do not have to be in a dichotomy relationship. Disarmament um, has basically two origins. I mean, one is we talk about, you know, the, the uns unconstrained arms race 
not in the benefits of anyone from a security point of view, and therefore we you know, come to a negotiation table and then agree on instruments um, on arms control and disarmament. Mm -hmm. That's the security origin of disarmament discourse. Um, simultaneously, uh, many of those uh, disarmament <coughs> treaties, chemical weapons convention, you know, uh, case in point, um, were born out of humanitarian concerns. Um, any weapon systems that will give, mm. you know, um, um, inhumane um, impact on, on their soldiers or, and, and also, of course, the civilians uh, to be uh, regulated and, and banned. Um, th those humanitarian considerations have always been there and member states in the, the international community found those humanitarian concerns to be also beneficial to their own soldiers and, and their citizens. So that's another origin of disarmament um, discourse. So I think what we need to do is to always look at both dimensions mm -hmm. um, to um, you know, you, since you mentioned TPNW, the Treaty of um, Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, um, it's not just in the TPNW um, that uh, catastrophic humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons are, uh, are being discussed. I think there is uh, increasing um, interest within also the MPT context um, that this uh, humanitarian impact is um, also reminded. Um, the fact that um, the president's, uh, President Putin and Biden reconfirmed the, the, the Reagan-Gorbachev um, uh, statement is also partially because of the, the humanitarian um, uh, concerns. So, so my hope is that these two will always be looked at um, you know, simultaneously. Mm. Um, and then I think we need to um, also, um, you know, this is a homework uh, for myself, but we need to have a little bit more of a, a focus on environmental impact as well, but that's, uh, that's to become. Yes. Thank you very much. Our next question, Aki Nakai who is a postdoctoral fellow at the program on U.S.-Japan relations for the Center of Global Governance and is a political science PhD and a scholar of international relations in the U.S.-Japan Alliance. Thank you so much for uh, Under Secretary General uh, Nakamitsu and Professor Davis. Um, as you know, the growing tensions and the competition between the United States and China has impacted on international politics, international economics in so many ways. I'm just wondering how how uh, how is this uh, growing tension between the two countries impact on UN effort toward the disarmament and arms controls? Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, it's a it's a very um, important question. Um, I think everyone is very much focused on that very question and, and try to better understand what might be a potential impact. One important thing, um, my own observation, but I think it was largely shared by many uh, from this year's high level uh, week uh, of the, uh, the General Assembly, um, it was important to note that both President Biden and um, President Xi Jinping um, said that they do not want to have new Cold War um, and they need to identify an area where they could work together. And I think climate is, of course, one you know, easy area that you know, many people refer to. Um, but um, in, you know, in many, there are many indications that arms control and, and disarmament could be uh, such an area where they could al also find a common interest um, to work uh, towards. So we, you know, in a sort of a very general uh, sense, we very much hope that that will be the case. Um, and um, one place where it will be a lit um, uh, test uh, is the MPT uh, review conference, obviously. Um, and um, I think the, the previous, you know, historically, the MPT review conferences uh, achieved success when they are unity uh, or shared interest 
uh, by uh, nuclear weapon states. Um, and, um, and I think uh, my sense, uh, you know, from uh, many of those meetings that are taking place now to prepare for the January um, review conference is that generally speaking, all P5, all nuclear weapon states want to have a, a reasonably successful uh, review conference um, in January next year. Um, so at the sort of global level of norm-making um, discussions, uh, engagements, I think um, there is a way to maintain that cooperation between um, the United States uh, and also China. Uh, even though many new developments like AUKUS, for example, uh, definitely do have you know, impact um, and, and we see that in the, the first committee the deliberations. Um, so I think, um, you know, for now at the global level, we need to make sure that, you know, all P5, but in particular the United States, the Russian Federation and, the, and, and China, um, take their special responsibility as nuclear weapon states um, and making sure that a successful outcome will be uh, coming out from those uh, multilateral platforms. Um, one thing, but going to the region, um, you know, our region, uh, the, the, the Far East Asia, you know, many of those um, quite negative trends that we see at the global level, you know, deteriorating relationships, eroding agreements, um, etc. Um, they are definitely, you know, uh, we can see that at the regional level in, in many ways in much more intensified manner. What we would like to see, um, and we encourage, um, you know, the states in the region, um, a little bit like, or largely like um, what we have been working with uh, MPT states parties in the context of the MPT discussions, I think there will have to be quite urgently some serious discussions on risk reduction measures in the region. Um, those arms build up, um, you know, rhetorics heating up uh, in the region uh, and uh, defense uh, expenditures going up in the region. All these things happening against the background of no risk reduction measures, um, no, you know, serious uh, instruments, mechanisms for crisis communication, um, for uh, escalation containment. Um, um, that is dangerous, um, and and so we, you know, encourage states in the region to to make sure that they will be urgently. Uh, some sort of a, a crisis risk reduction um, measures and crisis mitigation measures be uh, created. Um, but um, I hope that there is at least a, a awareness on the part of those uh, countries that um, that is required. Um, that understanding is there, I hope. Excellent. I don't see any questions from our online group, but I would like to take one last question from the audience here. I didn't see. Oh, right in front of me. <laughs> yes. Hi, my name is Mayumi Fukushima. I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the Belfast Center's ISP program. Thank you, thank you so much for coming. And, um, I used to work for um, uh, the Japanese Foreign Ministry as a senior diplomat. Um, the, the Foreign Ministry was extremely male-dominated work environment. And in academia, a vast majority of faculty positions in, in international security, international relations are still occupied by men or white men. And, um, I guess the United Nations, sorry, the Uni United Nations uh, is not uh, is not an exception, I guess. So, I think everybody in this room is very curious. So, um, <laughs> I wonder if, if you could talk about how you know you managed to climb the career ladder so successfully, right? Despite all the you know male-dominated environment. Um, have you experienced any setbacks, 
If so, how you manage to bounce back and what's the message that you want to share with future female leaders in the international security and peace? Thank you. Thank you very much for that question. It's an issue obviously very close to my heart. Um, I think very simply I, I managed to, um, to make it because I, I didn't work in Japan. Um, I worked in, in the United Nations where I, I was fortunate enough to have very understanding uh, supervisors, the bosses and, and mentors and role models. Um, obviously, Mrs. Ogato was one of my role models, but there were several others um, uh, in the UN community. Um, you know, the UN has come a long way. Um, when I was deployed to uh, Sarajevo, and that was 1992, um, in the midst of, uh, um, you know, um, heavy uh, battles, um, I was the, the first international female um, staff of the UN to, to be sent to Sarajevo. Um, we didn't have, you know, female latrines and, uh, you know, shower facilities and things like that. So from that situation in early 90s and today, um, we have, uh, you know, under the, the Secretary General, uh, we now have a gender parity strategy where we will achieve at all levels um, by 2028 parity. Parity is 50-50. Um, and, um, and we have not just the plan and the target, but this has been really integrated into, you know, everything, all the systems that we have in the UN. Um, you know, it's um, integrated into, of course, uh, you know, hiring, recruiting uh, policies to performance evaluation of myself. You know, if I'm not actually moving, you know, making progress, it will backfire on my own performance uh, evaluation by the Secretary General. Um, we have um, um, every six months we receive a scorecard and, and you know, which is public, um, you know, demonstrating where we are making progress and where we are sort of falling behind and therefore have to make extra efforts, etc. It's, it's all integrated across every system that we have at the UN. Um, I think, you know, changing this, um, especially in the security field, as you say, um, is, um, uh, is a big issue. Uh, we have to make sure that we have a clear plan, good strategy and good monitoring and, and evaluations mechanism to make sure that we are actually implementing. Um, so that's one. Um, Obviously, you know, the culture, you know, institutional culture, um, that plays a, a big um, part of it. Uh, we have to consistently, uh, you know, um, be mindful of changing the, the organizational culture where no harassment is taking place, uh, absolutely no, um, you know, discrimination taking place in, in workplace. Um, so, you know, both the is sort of institutional and policy dimensions and, and, and the organizational dimensions. Uh, as well. And um, one thing that I am very keen is to make sure that there will be more opportunities for education uh, empowerment uh, for younger women. Um, if we want to promote more women into senior positions, we need to have good pipeline of uh, younger people being trained. So in, in the UN process, at least uh, all of those opportunities, uh, it is always 50-50. Uh, um, I do not go to you know, international conferences uh, if the, the panel is all single uh, sex. Uh, it's a policy. Are we in trouble? <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a policy of the UN to always um, um, you know, remind uh, the, the organizer that they have to, you know, um, they have to make sure that um, you know, the gender participation is uh, um, equal. And this is, why do we do this? It's because of course it's the right thing to do. It's a human right. Um, gender equality is a, a human rights issue, but it is a um, smart thing to do uh, by you know, making sure that there is diversity of perspectives. We get to better results. Uh, we, you know, our policies, the policies that we formulate, the quality of it is higher. 
And this we, we know, um, and it has been, uh, you know, there are a lot of data and evidence uh, that prove that uh, diversity brings uh, a better outcome. Um, and, and so for us, it's not just the right thing to do, but it is uh, also a smart thing to do. Uh, and I've seen it myself in the conference rooms uh, where younger women uh, diplomats are uh, uh, taking, you know, uh, more active roles in cyber discussions, for example. Um, the quality of discussions clearly higher. Um, it's much better. So, so we need to, to really understand why we do this. Um, and uh, it's a priority of the UN. Thank you so much. You serve as a role model to <laughs> all women <laughs> and scholars and students. And it's really been a delight to have you here discussing the work you're doing that's so important. Thank you very much for taking the time, taking our questions. We really appreciate it and oh, good luck in you. your work ahead. <laughs> thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed this conversation. <laughs>